have Andy here. Um, she has, I've known her since uh, my early days at MIT. Um, she took me under her wing, along with her husband, Chuck Rich. Um, and I've been following her work for many years, always um, uh, very much in admiration of it. And uh, we were very lucky to have uh, Candy here to talk to us today about uh, oh, creating a real-time conversation manager. Um, and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing um, your, your current exploits. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank you all for inviting me to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a real-time kind of conversational manager, but it's going to take us a while to get there. And I want to mention that the work I'm doing, I don't do by myself. All of you must know this. Work gets done in a group of people. My collaborators at Worcester Polytech are Chuck Rich and a couple of graduate students, and also my collaborators are at Northeastern University, Tim Bickmore, and a group of his students as well. Okay. So the motivation for this work is a project we have from the National Science Foundation. Um, it's called Always On Relational Agents for supporting older adults um, to reduce their social isolation. Um, and uh, we're in the third year of this project, so there's been lots of empirical, empirical observations that have gone, along, uh, gone on during this time. I'll say a little bit about some of those. Um, there's still some pilot studies currently going on, and we're in the midst of system development to develop the thing I'm going to show you. So let's take a break. And what's coming in September is a longitudinal study. We're putting our virtual agent, who's up there, um, in people's homes for a month. And if all goes well, we're also going to put robots in people's homes for a month. Not robots that move around the floor, just ones that talk to you but do gestures and stuff like that. And that condition horrifies me because <laughs> robots break a lot. Um, so <laughs> stay tuned for my <laughs> how my life is going to go. So what I'm going to do is show you um, the, a, what we call a vision piece. Come on, go back to the beginning. Why don't you go back to the beginning? Okay. Um, and this is something we did about a year and a half ago, and it's a vision piece because it's really held together with shoestring and bubblegum. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about is the thing, what we're actually doing to make this vision real. So, da -da -da. The Always On Project is a collaboration between Worcester Polytech Institute and the Relational Agents Group at Northeastern University. Our goal is to develop technologies that can address the needs of isolated older adults. The Always On Virtual Agent, Karen, is a social companion who is always available and always aware when her human partner comes into her presence. She has an understanding of relationships which adapts over time. Here we see a scene when Karen and Bob are already somewhat acquainted. Karen greets Bob, who is not interested in talking just then. <laughs> Good morning, Bob. Now Bob is ready to have a talk with Karen. Bob communicates through a menu of utterance choices on the screen, which he can touch or say to Karen. As part of their ongoing relationship, Karen and Bob have social chit-chat about the weather and Bob's big interest in baseball. Hi. Good to see you. It's quite warm, but it is going to rain in the afternoon. Tomorrow is going to be very sunny. And by the way, they are expecting snow in Miami. Mm -hmm. Yes, really crazy weather. When playing a social game of cards, Karen can talk about her hand in the game, as well as other social conversation, like sports. Karen supports Bob's social interaction with others by keeping Bob updated on his family through social media, such as Facebook. Oh, before I forget, Susie put some new pictures on Facebook. Do you want to see them now? Let me show them to you. Karen assesses her relationship with Bob in deciding when to do something new, such as getting Bob started on exercise. During the card game, she opens the topic of getting an exercise buddy and makes suggestions in an attempt to interest Bob. You know, I've been thinking, are you interested in finding a walking buddy? Walking with someone else is more fun. A walking buddy is a friend you walk with regularly. Well, we could try to find someone who lives in this building to go walking with you. 
We can make a sign that you can post it in the lobby. Or we can use Facebook. <coughs> How about a sign that says, Wanted, Daily Walking Body, and your name? Great, I'll make a sample sign and show it to you a little later. Okay? Good. Now if I remember correctly, it's your turn, Lummy. The technology in this demonstration is a mixture of prototype and mock-up. Using OpenCV and our own algorithms, Karen is able to visually find and track Bob. The models of dialogue for Facebook, cards, and other tests are currently scripted. However, our research plans include replacing scripts with techniques to retrieve online weather and sports information automatically, and new directions for using the dialogue engine Disco with models of relationships to create a social agent who can participate in long-term relationships. Karen also helps Bob keep track of his schedule. In this interaction, she notices when it's time for him to go to a social event and end the card game. Oh, it's almost three o'clock. It's time for you to go to the lobby for the aquarium trip. Let's finish this game later. We have begun a series of empirical studies to better understand the needs of isolated elders, including what they might want to talk about with a virtual agent. Our goal is to provide an agent who is a useful companion in providing social support for older adults. See you later. Okay, go on. What happened? <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, um, truth in advertising, this is not speech in the sense of you, that you think of it. Um, if we use speech at all, which we probably will not do, um, it would be speech to say what's in the particular menus, which works phenomenally well in most circumstances, but it's not speech recognition and speech understanding. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what it would mean to build this kind of system. What kind of capabilities do we need? First of all, there are capabilities in dialogue. Um, we have a wide range of topics of conversation or tasks, if you will, to accomplish. Social card games, which means you talk about the card game as you saw as well as other things. A calendar program, we already have working a weather program. And I don't mean, you know, the weather in Boston is 35 degrees and we're 25 by tonight, but you can have a five minute conversation with our agent about the weather, believe it or not. Everything from what the weather was like in history to the weather where your best friend lives, that kind of thing. Um, we're developing an, out, um, a, an application we call Skype Buddy. So one of the things that we take very seriously in this effort is that there are no GUIs. Forget GUIs, it doesn't exist. There is a touch screen. You interact by picking what you want to say off the menu, and in a, some small number of cases, like when you're playing cards, you manipulate your turn in the hand. Or in the case of a calendar, if the agent asks you what's the meeting that you want to change, you can point at the entry in the calendar, and that's it. So it's not the GUI paradigm we usually think of. And we've taken this seriously because of the population we're thinking of. Nobody in this room would have a problem. Most people who are seven years of age and older really don't use GUI systems very well, and mice are kind of almost beyond them. So that was one of the things we wanted to be serious about. Exercise coaching, this is work we're doing based on work that Tim Bickmore has been doing for a number of years. We're developing what we call a story listening or acquisition application. So this is the one place where you really get speech you tell a story, in fact, we'll probably, we're looking at videotaping them. And what the agent is doing is simply listening, recording the story, and then ask you afterwards something about what that story is about so that it can have some better model in its memory than the person just made up a story and I don't know anything about it. Talk about friends. Um, this happens to be the most difficult thing. If I'm putting utterances on a screen for you to say, when it comes to what's going on with your friends, that's really tough to do in advance. Um, if you think about any of your friends and what their lives are like, there's only a few things you can kind of predict in advance enough to start out a conversation like that where the menus are made up in advance. So that's turned out to be one of the most head-scratching difficulties for us. Also sports talk. 
both for sports and weather, we're making use of RSS feeds so that every time you have the conversation, it's a different conversation because it's about what's really going on. So some of this talk is very goal-oriented, things like your calendar program and getting new events in your calendar. Some of it is totally shoot the breeze sorts of things, like the weather. Um, and some of it's kind of halfway in between. There are interruptions. If we're doing the card game and we switch and talk about um, you know, getting an exercise buddy or something like that, that's a kind of interruption. And we're also looking at low-level interruptions in terms of real-time things, and I'll come back to that. There's structure to the dialogue that not, may not be obvious, other than if you're going to talk about all those things, each one of them represents at least a different top-level structure. As it turns out, it's very useful to have structure as you go along and build these particular things. Um, and there's also give and take. And by give and take, I mean something more than our old-fashioned notions of turn-taking. So in the language community, turn-taking really originally came from ideas that really came out of linguistics and largely out of the ethnomethodologists, which was looking at language behavior. But as I'll come back to in a minute, I want us to be thinking about other kinds of things than that. Other kinds of capabilities. Over the past 10 years, I've become very interested in the nonverbal behavior that accompanies conversation. I call this basic issues and engagements. Engagement is how we manage our connection to the other person, how we start that. How do you walk up to somebody and begin a conversation? What do you do during the middle of it? And so forth. Um, so it's about the attention of the user and the system. Both parties in an interaction are paying attention, looking at what's going on, thinking about it. So that's part of the process that we want to um, be clear about. There's also nodding on the part of the agent. Nodding by the user, uh-huh, I heard that. Um, the agent pointing. So the take home message for part of this is, one, this is real time interaction and this is interaction involves more than language. It involves being able to look in the environment. So my colleague Chuck Rich claims that our virtual agents really are very, uh, they are robots with very skinny bodies. Not sure I'm entirely happy with that notion, but they are certainly taking in information through several different channels. They're making decisions and they're producing behavior out of that and some of that behavior is, all of that behavior at the moment is in the virtual world, but it certainly is a world that both of the parties can take part in. Um, so where are we getting some of our tools? So while our dialogue tools come from work that Chuck Rich and I have been doing for another number of years, the system we're using is called Disco. It's a success, successor to Collagen, which is a tool we originally developed at Mitsubishi Labs. Disco and Collagen, its predecessor, are based on work that Barbara Gross and I and her uh, colleagues, Sari Krauss and Karen Lachbaum, did on collaborative models of discourse structure. It include, includes a component that was developed for gaming, which it makes it possible to develop dialogue scripts. So putting in all those menus turns out to be something you can do while also making use of top level dialogue structure. Um, and it extends the original theory that Barbara and I developed to generation as well as interpretation. Disco itself has the standard simple minded notion of turn taking. I get a turn, the robot gets, or the whatever the agent is gets a turn and so on. And we'll come back to how we want to change that. And this is an open source system now with several years of use. Um, and if you want it, send me email and you can have it. OK, for, for engagement. So engagement is work that we've also been doing largely in the context of our robot. This is one of our robots. This is Melvin. And this is Melvin doing um, a version of a tangram game. He's uh, getting a person to put together a tangram by properly pointing at the objects in the, in the, on the table using a model from uh, Matt Stone's original work about um, how to um, model what the entities are in the environment. And so the robot properly is able to point, look at the same time, then look back at the person. And when it points, it's saying things mm -hmm. like the pink block, if it needs to, because there's more than one pink block, or just the, the square 
or that one. And so it's got a, it uses a utility model to decide which one of those kinds of utterances makes sense. Um, and this is all done in the context of some work we did on the recognition and generation of, of uh, engagement. Um, what we want to do as part of our current work is give this original work a kind of more principled pr approach with a reusable tool. And you'll see how this comes to play in the, in the real-time architecture in a minute. So now I want to turn and talk about this issue about what it means to take turns. And to do this, I'm going to pick up on some work that Herb Clark has done um, that you know, is sort of on the same wavelength as the kinds of things I've been interested in. So Herb pointed out that when people, the one way to look at the world is that they are speaking and they're speaking by turns. And when you do that, there's timing. One person speaks for the most part. You know, they're in that way of looking at things, the interruptions that happen across the boundaries of people trying to talk are kind of oddities, if you will. Um, on the other hand, if you take a different point of view, which is the view of how we are working together, how we are getting things done, then in fact you stop thinking in terms of just speech and you look at how people are signaling. So it may be that because the speech channel really only allows one person to make all the noises at one particular time, there's still a lot of signaling going on that's happening on the parts of both of them. There are things about where they're both looking at one another. There are things about what they're paying attention to and not paying attention to. Okay, so if the medium is speech only, then it makes sense to talk about turns. But when we look at gestures, at the placement of our bodies, which way we're point, you know, which way we're standing, and where we turn with our bodies, we get a very different take on this sort of thing. Again, if we focus on dialogue, that is on language behavior, speaking kind of in turns makes sense. But if we turn and look at joint activity, dialogue is an important piece of what goes on. But then the other things that are happening in the circumstance matter. So it matters if I never mention what I'm doing right now, although I am obviously <laughs> at the moment and I simply do something and you're able to follow it and pay attention to it. So there's a lot that can happen beyond the words themselves the, and the particular part of the linguistic structure that makes up the dialogue. Okay, so another way to look at this is in speaking by turns, somebody thinks about something, they send a message, they say something to the other person, that person speak, speaks maybe briefly or thinks briefly, and sends another message back, okay? And we go through this over and over again. But in fact, what we really want is to look at the world in terms of how we're working together. So messages are going back and forth. There is gesturing things that are happening and the people are speaking and there's this process to manage because they're trying to get something done. Uh, many people in my community have said to me, yeah, that's fine when you're talking about tasks, but a lot of what people do is just talk to each other and I'm not gonna um, prove this to you today, but I think that this kind of model matters even if we're standing on the street corner waiting for the bus and having a conversation about the weather. All right. So in order to get all of those things to function in a way that gets us beyond simply verbal behavior, um, we are interested in what we call a hierarchy of time scales. And here I need to mention one more thing. The video that I showed you talked about relationship. Um, one of the pieces of work that we have done is to look at relationships in interactions. And we have developed a model, we call it the relationship planner, which says, okay, at various points in time when you interact with someone, you're not in the same kind of relationship. So if I had a computer that I had interactions with over a long period of time, it would be interesting to think of it as we're initially strangers, then the, you get to know the computer somehow better and it gets to know something about you better and maybe you become something like acquaintances and then a little more happens, a little more time goes by, you do more things, you're able to do more things and you move into yet another kind of stage of relationship. 
We've ended up thinking about this in terms of closeness. So not the, rather than have these labels like acquaintance, companion, or friend, or all these things that are, I think, a little loaded for talking about our computers and our robots. We've put this in the terms of developing more and more closeness. So a relationship planner is providing some information about the state of the relationship <coughs> and so what might make sense to do at this particular point. But the planner is doing this on the basis of a fairly long time scale. You know, it gets an hour or part of a day to kind of work out its plan, think about what's going on. And so it, the example here is, well, we're close enough now that I can talk about diet with you. This is not a conversation you have with a stranger, or at least not if you have any brains at all. Um, <laughs> but it certainly is a conversation you can have after a certain point of knowing someone. And even our model worries about, OK, we're in a conversation right now, but I don't start even the conversation today when I see you straight off the bat by saying, so how about starting to think about changing your diet? That's uh, truly a little strange. And so we are concerned about being able to do that. So that's one kind of level of timing. And that's over a fairly long period of time. Another level, which we'll, we call the resource arbitration level, is, OK, now we're in this conversation. What's happening over the next several minutes, maybe even an hour? And how do we manage the resources that might come to play? So is there enough time for me right now to talk about diet before you have to go to, on some meeting, some, to, go to some trip at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If there's not, then even if that was part of what the lab relationship planner wanted to do, it's not going to happen. Uh, there's just not time to make that kind of thing happen. On the very, what I think of as lowest level, is event synchronization. And this is where, at the you know, millisecond and second level, there are all the things about the fact that the agent is seeing information from the person. It's paying attention. We have a motion sensor as well as uh, cameras that we're using on our, on our agents. And so there's information coming in that needs to be dealt with. At the same time, that information means that the agent is going to have to do something fairly quickly. And these are things like, if I'm going to talk about the card game and say this card, I want the agent to actually look at that particular card on the screen at that point in time. So this is very low level, fast turnaround, truly real time kind of behavior. OK. So I want to go back and say a little bit about relationship planning in more detail so you can see what it is that we're really trying to do there. So our agent is planning activities, like whether it should have a Skype buddy conversation with you or talk about the weather or whatever, on the basis of the relationship. We model this in terms of closeness. And closeness is a numerical value. It starts off at 0 the first time some user and some agent ever interact. And it changes as activities are accomplished. Um, so the value gets updated. And there are utility benefits associated with some activities. Some activities really matter more in some sense. They have more utility than other agents do. And so the planner's job, just a minute. How uh, that by him? Say again? Are those values added by end? They're added over, yeah, they were added sequentially over time as you do activities. So if you do, <laughs> if all we do is talk about the weather and play a card game, you get a little more close to the other person. Um, and that may then make it possible to say, so would you like to tell me a story? OK? Um, and it may take all of that before you say, OK, we're close enough now to actually have a conversation about something that's a little bit sticky like starting to exercise when you don't want to do that. Um, so this ordered set of activities is the plan. And that's what the planner is trying to do. And it's trying to maximize the utilities for a particular time interval. So usually the planner is thinking in terms of, I might get a half an hour with this person today. What can I put in that period of time? And all of there's metadata associated with all the activities, like Skype Buddy and the weather and so forth that say, It'll take roughly this amount of time to do this particular activity. It could take less. The conversation about weather could be, I want to hear about the weather in my neighborhood, and I don't want to, ha I don't want to hear it today about 
what it was like in history, or and I don't care what's going on at my friend's house in, in California. So that, that conversation could be much shorter. OK. So let me give you a little example of how this really comes into being. Okay. So here's a relationship plan that's created by our planning agent. Um, and this is a session. Um, suppose there has been a, 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 a session, and the baseline closeness after that first session is 3. Um, it ends at, uh, starts at 3, it goes to 6. And so now um, we have a proposal that we have this kind of conversation. Talk about baseball, and then either, and this is based on what the user wants to do, talk about the calendar or humorous anecdotes, and depending upon that, several other choices. Okay. What happens, of course, is that you may not get through all of that in the time that's allowed. And so imagine that just a couple of those things happen. And then when the, that information is then passed back to the planner, the planner says, OK, we got a certain amount done. That changes the baseline closeness. So for the next session, we're going to have, we're going to have some amount of closeness to deal with. But our planner also takes into account the fact that if the next session isn't two hours from now, but is two days from now, there's going to be a decay effect on closeness. So even if the end closeness was six after this interaction, by the time the next one happens, it may have decayed to four. And so it's going to have to do its planning based on what the closeness is at that point. So this gives you a sense of what it is that the planning system is actually doing and a bit about how it actually goes about that. All right. So now let's turn and look at this question of what it means to have an architecture in which we have various timescales operating. So I told you a little bit about the relationship manager. And its job is to plan the session that's going to happen with the user. It does that as a set of activities. And the source of its information comes from what we call the content plugins. I'll say a little bit more about them in a minute. But that provides the planner with a set of possible activities. And it chooses among them based on what required closeness is needed for those activities. So there's no closeness needed to talk about the weather. And there's a pretty considerable closeness, probably around six, needed to talk about how to get you to exercise and sort of things in the middle along the way. Uh, playing a game of rummy, we figure, is around zero or maybe one, that sort of thing. So the relationship manager has information it's getting from each of those plugins about what closeness is needed, as well as what closeness will result if those activities are accomplished. So one of the things it's doing is saying, well, if I need to talk about exercise, or I think I can finally because we're close enough, but I can't do that immediately when I start the conversation, what other activities could happen in there to kind of warm things up so that I can then have this interaction? So that's the nature of what this relationship agent is doing. The result of that is this description of a set of things that might go on during the day. And it's a tree, as I showed you in the previous slide, so that the user has a fair amount of control over what it is that happens. And of course, for any given place where there are no choices, the user could also say, I don't want to do this. Read. So, so typically in planning, there's a goal. Right. And is the goal to increase yes. closeness, or is the goal to discuss the diet? No, the, in, the goal is to increase closeness over time. That's the relationship plan, planner's picture of the world. Um, and um, it has a whole range of activities to choose from to make all of that happen. Um, and so it's going to pick things that will support uh, extending that relationship over time. Have you thought about having specific goals? Like some caretaker says, you really want this person to exercise more. And so you do plans in order to kind of? Um, we thought a little bit about this. The, there's, there's a different kind of challenge coming once you ask some other program or person to say something about what this process ought to be able to look like. 
Um, and that is that you introduce a, a different set of constraints on how this story ought to go. There's nothing wrong with that story. It's just that for the moment, we wanted to have people less involved in how this process happens because we know we're going to put these in people's houses and we want to let the agent be its own autonomous being as much as possible. So that's why the relationship is something that the agent has a model of and tries to manage and it's not trying to take, how should I put it, advice from some human at this time. But you could, there's no reason you couldn't think about it. Uh, things that, you know, so for instance, you you suggest uh, an exercise buddy for someone who is wheelchair bound, and that's probably not a good idea. So it definitely would not be good. So you, you do want to take personal yes. information into account. Absolutely. There's no reason you can't do that. Is there any type of semantic information in the relation, in the, the task that? There's oh. this thing. Okay. I'll come back to that in okay. a minute. Yeah. Chill. So this is really just a follow I think, to follow up um, yeah. on a piece of what we were just asking. Um, can the relationship manager modify its own notion of the, the closeness that is required for and resulting from activities based on the feedback it's getting? If I keep telling you, I don't want to talk about it, at some point you really ought to know yes, this yes. is not an effective way for me to move from closeness to That's closeness. right. So for example, if the relationship manager proposes we've gotten close, this close on exercise, and keeps trying to get you to talk about exercise, and you ignore that conversation every time. Um, we have a really simple mechanism that says, you know, basically, three times and you're out. Um, but you could imagine having that be a much more sophisticated model of what does it mean to have preferences among, among the things because that for people example, do. I might notice about somebody that, although I don't think Jim Learning would do much, they seem to seek it out. They seem to enjoy right. it. Right. Um, the evidence for that is that they're seeking it out on a regular basis. Right. And maybe that's actually creating a lot more closeness. And that yeah, to be right, exactly. Mainline. Yeah, yeah. That, w that's, that piece of the pie we haven't actually explored. But it's absolutely reasonable to think about how do I begin to build a richer model of what I've learned about this particular user in terms of those kinds of behaviors. We have some other things in mind which I'll mention, but that one we haven't pushed in that particular direction. All right, so the relationship manager provides an activity level plan. This goes to what we call Disco RT. So this is Disco with a real time component. It's got a Disco model in the, in the middle of it, and I'll explain how that's used. But it's real time because it's doing these tasks of resource arbitration and event synchronization. So this is the engine that is looking at how do we make things that happen at the microsecond, the millisecond level, at the second level, as well as making choices among various different things that I might be doing. So if the person, you know, says, no, I want to, don't want to do exercise, but they do want to play a card game, they play it for a long period of time, um, and then it may be that we then move to an interesting point in the arbitration process, which is now there's this event coming, like either going to a, something that doesn't involve the agent or, for example, a Skype interaction that requires that something happen at a fairly close period of time. So these are the things that that system is managing. Content plugins. So the content plugins are the things like the weather, calendaring programs, Skype Buddy, um, exercise uh, advancement, um, all of those particular applications. And each one of those applications has a model of what it is that the person's do to do and also what kind of conversation you can have about it. When it's something like a calendar program or the Skype Buddy application, that means not only are you chatting back and forth with the person, but there may be actually something physically that the agent has to show you. Uh, during the interaction, or the agent may, in the case of Skype Buddy, it steps out of the way. So in Skype Buddy, what the agent is doing is it's saying, okay, I know how to set up the call. I'm setting it up, contacting the other person, make sure they're there. And once all of that is taken care of, which we all do with Skype ourselves by manipulating all kinds of funny things in Skype, once all that is ready, the agent steps out of the way and just lets the conversation happen. 
And in fact, we're using the Skype um, toolkit to make it possible to know what to do when a part of the call gets dropped. How Skype actually does this is pretty complicated, and we've taken a particular cut on this to say that we are going to allow just one of the many ways you can play around in the Skype world actually work as the, it's simply video calls and not all the other things. So that's a piece of that kind of thing. So each one of those plugins has a bunch of information and the disk RT system essentially has to decide when to essentially give over control to that application. Finally, one more thing that is important in this is that we have a semantic network. We're currently using OWL for this, um, not in a very sophisticated way. Um, it's to handle a couple of different things. So over time, as the agent learns things about the person, they get stored in a very simple, you know, there are people, they have locations and phone numbers, that kind of stuff. Um, to handle things like how to do this, how to get everything in Skype to work right. Um, also, that information is used by the weather program to find out the places in the world where the person has friends that might, might want to know about the weather for. Um, as the, in the, the story acquisition system uses this to keep the title of the story and also uses a pre-built simple, stretch simple here, a model of what kinds of things you can tell stories about. So life stories come in the come of the flavors of life stories from your childhood, your teenage years, young adulthood, so on and so forth. And we've also are playing with another interesting aspect of story acquisition, which is to get people to tell stories that may have some kind of positive um, outcome on for the person who we originally who's originally telling the story. The reason for this has simply to do with the population that we're dealing with. There is some literature in sociology that suggests that you can improve the outlook of isolated people by getting them to reflect on their lives in positive ways. So we thought this was pretty interesting and so it's one of the things, part of asking people to tell a story is to kind of prime them into storytelling. If I put you in front of a computer and say, tell me a story, the agent says, telling me a story, your first reaction is, okay, what do I tell a story about today? Which is not very helpful. So asking people to tell a life story is one way to prime them. Asking them to tell a story about something you did that you felt really had a benefit for some other person is another kind of way of approaching stories um, which people then you know, can make use of. But if they do that, of course, the agent doesn't understand a word of the story. We're not solving the natural language story, story understanding problem in this project. So at the end, one of the things we're using the network for is to ask the agent, what kind of story is this? So we can store that information and reuse it later to say, well, you know, yesterday or two days ago, you told me a story about when you were a child and, and you know, you had an accident. How about telling me a story about something from your teenage years? So that's the, one of the ways and another way in which we're using the network. So the network is both collecting immediate information from people as, the, as they get to know each other. It's also using very simple-minded knowledge to gather information as well. Yeah? So this card is taking, allowing the person to generate free text and it's not being understood. Not being understood you're at all. You're looking for certain things. You are not trying to look for anything in it. And okay. all the agent is doing for that for story acquisition oh. is the is the initial priming. And while that while the story is being told, it sits there and nods, using the best available tools, not our own, but developed in fact at ICT are the tools we're currently using, to um, notice when there is a pause happening and then stick a nod in, or a head shake or an eyebrow raise in at that particular point in time. Modulo, there are some tricks about how often you should do this. I won't bore you with the details, but nonetheless, um, that's a concern. We tried, as I was telling people before um, I started speaking, uh, to stick a hans in there. <laughs> Turns out it doesn't work right. Um, it's very hard to get the timing of that properly. We don't have enough information to do it right, is, is my sense of things. Okay. So now you have a kind of high-level picture of this. 
Now, because I figure there are some computer scientists in the room, I'll say a little bit more about this. Disk R2 is, R, RT, as I mentioned, is hand nailing resource arbitration, which we think of as soft real time, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, and the hard real time stuff, the stuff that's really got to happen. The design influences for this particular work are work we've done in plan based dialogue. It's also, we've been very influenced by the robotics community, reactive systems, the layering kinds of things that Rod Brooks talked about in his classic paper. Um, synchronization languages, so another piece of what controls our particular agent is the BML language. Um, we use that as the way it gets told what to do, as well as our own work on engagement. Um, so now let's take a look in a little more detail at what that architecture really looks like. And here, if you're not a computer scientist, you may decide this is not the sort of stuff you want to hear about. So one part of this architecture we call the perceptors. And these are the set of programs that are using sensory information. In our case, they are face detection. Um, we're using motion detection sensors. The menu input is another s sensor, if you will. And somewhere before we finish this whole thing, we hope we'll be able to do a little emotion detection. We thought that would be an interesting extra thing to think about. But um, it's certainly not something I think we'll actually get in people's houses in September. Um, so there's the information that's coming in. On the other side, let's go, that's one of those things that's really hard real time. The other thing that's really hard real time is what we call the resources. These are the things that are associated with the agent. Our agent has a voice. Yeah, yes. Quick question about your face detection mm -hmm. perceptor. Are you identifying the user or also identifying is the user looking it into the agent or looking away? Or yeah, we're interested there? in um, not only the fact that it's there, but also that it's looking in certain directions. Uh, very loose notion of looking. Um, we just recently started playing around with a gaze detection algorithm that comes out of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, it's called IAPI. And it looks like for a screen, a decent sized screen that you can actually tell when the person's looking here versus say up in the corner. Um, so that's, that's a little more information than you get from the standard um, you know, face detection algorithm. So that's kind of nice to have. But nonetheless, it's that level of. So we want to know, is the person paying attention to the agent? Is it looking at part of the screen? Has it decided to look elsewhere? Because the looking elsewhere, if it lasts very long, is an indication that this person is starting to disengage from the interaction. Okay. Resources. The thing has voice. It has, well, sometimes it has a hand. It has gaze. It has what the head is doing. Those are resources that um, the agent has. And that's true, of course, for the virtual agent as well as the robot. Um, and those are the other. This is the other really hard real-time thing that has to be controlled. Okay. From the relationship manager, we get that plan tree, which I showed you an example of. That's a disco entity. And the other important component of the disco system is what we call the focus stack. So this comes from the work of Gross and Seidner about the fact that there's a stack that goes up and down that accounts for how the discourse moves around. That focus stack is going to be critically used to understand what it is that's the focus of the interaction at this particular point in time. So it becomes a resource, not as hard real time necessarily as these other things, but it's a resource to be managed. Okay. Now, you hear C schemas. <laughs> this is one of the places where we picked up on robotics work, but it's, it's a, a metaphorical use, I think. There are a set of schemas, and these grow every period of time. The engagement schema is always operational. It's the one that's trying to make use, understand what to do with all that input that's coming in from the face and from motion sensing. There also is a planning schema. It's the one that says, I've got this set of activities that could be going on, and I can keep feeding these into this particular system. There then are schemas for all of those other content plugins I talked about, the weather, 
you know, playing rummy, whatever it happens to be, okay? And now the question is, who gets control? Which kind of activity is actually going to be in charge of things? And that turns on, in fact, um, this piece, which is whichever activity schema is operational gets to its first dibs on the resources that are needed. So if we're talking about the weather, you don't need the robots, well, the agent's hands, to talk about the weather, you, but you do need to make sure that the agent actually looks at the person appropriately and pays attention to how they're actually doing something. So there are resources that need, it, need to be managed. On the other hand, um, at some point, if there is a decision that geez, we can't talk about weather anymore because it's too close to getting to the Skype buddy operation, then in fact you want to arbitrate among those things, say, look, I'm taking control away from the weather resource and giving it to another one of the schemas, and that then will change how the resource, um, resources are doled out, doled out in a particular circumstance. So, Soft arbitration is making decisions, but not at every single second. Although, in fact, the resource arbitrator basically has a tick that's a half a second. So every half second, it's looking at the possible collection of schemas and deciding who gets to do what. And mostly, because it's using the focus stack here to manage things, it, its default is to say the thing that was running can keep going. But it has reasons to choose other things when, for example, some period of time has gone by that says there's either a hard boundary coming, like we have a Skype call at 3 o'clock, or we're only supposed to play rummy for a certain time today, so maybe we should stop playing rummy and do something else. Okay? So this is how this process is going. Yeah? So are there interrupts from the perception? Yes, actually there are. In the only real interruption that we've played with so far is in the case of menu input, um, if the agent is talking, the menu comes up and the agent hasn't finished blithering on for, their, um, for its turn in the interaction. If the user thinking, I know what they're going to say, I'm done, and hits the next, their chosen item in the menu, it's a barge in effect. So that's the one instance where there's something in a kind of real-time interrupt kind of way that we could imagine made sense in this kind of circumstance. Um, there's another one which has to do with um, people leaving. So, so one of the problems about having a system like this is it's in people's houses. You know, they're not just hanging out with the agent. The doorbell rings, I don't know, the telephone rings, whatever. The agent can't tell about any of that stuff. It has no model and no way to know about those things. At least we don't have tools to do that at this point in time. So, you know, the person disappears. <laughs> they go to answer the door. And all of a sudden, the person in the middle of some interaction with the agent has disappeared and, and, the, agent, and the agent has to figure out what to do. This is another kind of interrupt point and causes the resource arbitration system to say, okay, what do I do here? And the tack we have taken about this is to say, let's wait around for, we have a disagreement, I think a minute, everybody else thinks less time than that, um, and then decide, okay, the interaction is over. Um, so, but the point is, is that that's, that's, a, that's a real effect that we have to be thinking about because of, because of the situation in which um, this system is, is embedded. Um, and because we have limits in terms of being able to understand that larger situation. Um, and telephones and doorbells and I don't know, they can decide they just want to go to the bathroom or something. I mean, there's, not, there's a lot of stuff we just can't know about that is different from the human-human circumstance. But then you'd like to so, pick up where you left off in some cases. Yes, so uh, I'll come to back to that okay. in a minute. So let me give you a concrete example of how all this played. Yeah. Um, Oops. To, you yeah. may, are you going on to add more stuff, or can I ask you about this? Ask, be, ask whatever you want. Okay. So <laughs> in the beginning, when you started out by talking about parts work I, and, and different time scales, mm -hmm. I thought I was going to see an integration of grounding with relationship planning. And I don't, 
quite yet see how to map those two different time scales onto this architecture. OK, I don't think of grounding as, um, as a process that happens at the level of relationship planning. No, okay, relationship planning hard. is, I'm going to do this, it, it's a kind of, if you will, private activity of the agent to figure out what it thinks ought to be what we do today. So okay. it's not shared in the same way grounding is? Uh, well, grounding, the, the grounding process makes certain things shared, that, that's the theory of grounding anyway. The way this would come about is when the agent says, how about if we do X now? Okay, that's, that's as much of it, what it reveals of its, in some sense, what I think of as its private plan for the interaction at this point in time. And there is, we don't at the moment have any plan to have conversations about our relationship. Okay, so that's an interesting question whether that's a good thing to do or not, but we're, um, uh, I, th I think we're sort of, at least I'm sort of agnostic enough about this mechanism that I want to see it operational for a while before I ask the question, what would it mean to chat about, you know, it, and, uh, and partly it's because I don't know exactly what that conversation would look like. I'm reluctant to use the term other than stranger. I mean, stranger I guess I'm okay with between a, an agent and a, and a human being, but the rest of the language that one might use, like we're acquaintances now or we're friends or we're companions, is so loaded in my mind that I don't know how to imagine how that would go. So I think that's going to have to wait for the next, um, the next great set of ideas. Um, okay. Really what I wanted to push on <laughs> mm -hmm. was, you know, this reminds me of an argument that you and I had for around five years, and you clearly moved to my side of the argument, which is... Yeah, I have. <laughs> you can have this as a goal. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, but what I was on here was the notion of grounding being at the utterance level, mm -hmm. what relationship is being at the kind of life level or event level. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, that these are in fact quite similar. They're both very dyadic processes. They're both processes about moving the other person towards something. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a parity or a, um, a symmetry. I don't see the grounding here in such a way that you might see the architecture as reflecting those kinds okay, of things. Okay, so, so this is a longer conversation you and I should have. but. I have reservations about using grounding in the way that you want to talk about it for, plan for relationship planning. And that's partly because I have some problems about the whole notion of grounding in the first place. And that's because grounding, while a very kind of nice intuitive <coughs> concept that, that Herb Clark has given us, has no well understood semantics. So there's this notion that, you know, it's in our common ground after it's grounded between us. What the heck does that mean, okay? What, what, what are we talking about there? Is it mutual belief? Is it something else? I mean, I want a story for that, and nobody's given me that story. I did, many years ago, try and make an attempt in that direction. Um, but it's not something people even ever ask themselves. And I want to know what that is before I take that, what I think of as something of a metaphor, and push it way up into the social aspect of our lives. So, you know, maybe it's there, but I, I, I want to be more grounded before, <laughs> before I so, get there. Um, one more just really short technical sure, sure. question. So mm -hmm. I thought when you first started talking about resource arbitration mm -hmm. that you would have a functional description of the acti activity schemata such that they served a closeness goal. But here, it looks like they're described as a function of themselves, not the purpose they fill. Well, remember, the things that get to be activities in this list come from having thought, the relationship planner having said, these are the things that I, want, that I think you should get done, and here's how closeness changes over doing those particular things. So, so it's, it's in some sense implicit in that, and what I haven't said anything about is, after this session is over, there is a report back to the relationship planner of what got accomplished, what didn't get accomplished, what was proposed, and 
ignored. The person said, I don't want to do that today. So that information is returned to the relationship planner for the next time it's actually going to plan something out. Is it possible then to say, oh, we have three minutes till our Skype call. We can't play Rummy. But I could ask about his grandmother, and that would serve the same function. Uh, yes. That is, if they're, depending upon how, now, this, this component doesn't reason through those things. But it does have a notion that if there's some activity that can fit in that period of time, that makes sense, that's part of one of the proposals in the, in the plan tree, it certainly can do that. It's not, think, it's not a, it doesn't know from relationship, OK? <laughs> it's not doing that kind of thing. But it has information that allows it to operate. You can think of this more as like an operating system. It's not a relationship operating system. It's just a, an operating system that's got a bunch of things it is doing and trying to get them to fit in based on this plan that it's gotten for the interaction. OK? Yeah. All right, so let's do a simple little example. And you'll see which of the three kinds of things is going on. So a diet discussion is planned for the session. That's the sort of thing the relationship planner does. Here's the the resource arbitration that leads into event synchronization. The agent sees the person walk by, attempts to initiate a greeting with them. So there's a real-time piece of this, which is the recognition that something is happening in the environment. But the part about initiating a greeting is, in fact, this kind of soft thing. It's starting a conversation. Okay. During chit-chat about the weather, the person barges by, barges in by clicking on the menu. This is the sort of thing I mentioned. That's a kind of very real-time process and an, and an example of how you can actually interrupt the circumstance. During the card game, the agent looks toward the card display when it says this card. So if you remember in the video, when there's this big card game on the screen, the agent's up in the corner, but it has the ability and knows where to look to have certain things happen. Okay. Um, after playing cards for 10 minutes, the agent broaches the topic of diet. That's this process of deciding, OK, we've been doing this for a while. Let's stop that, uh, not stop the card game, but stop talking about the card game and start talking about diet. So card games we take as a very special kind of case. We call them container activities. They're activities that you can use as a kind of launch point for doing something else. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons we've wanted to keep something like card games or chess, well, not chess so much, but checkers or something like that, is that it's one of those things that we do socially that allows us to do other things on top of it. So you could talk about diet. You could talk about your family. Think about what you do when you play informal games with people. Um, <laughs> it, we're also making an assumption that it really is a social game. Um, the, one of the crossover games is bridge. I only play social bridge, OK? We get to chat, you know, because don't take it too seriously. But I know lots of people who don't play bridge that way at all. It's, you know, <laughs> you didn't signal right in, in that. And what's the matter with you kind of thing? So there's very different approaches to this. Um, the ADIS agent notices and reminds the person it's time to go to a previously scheduled call with the person's brother. So here is something that is, for the most type, it's a resource arbitration. It's time to stop this thing and do this other thing. There's a point at which it moves from being soft real time to, hey, we really have to do this now. Um, so there's interestingly both. The agent pauses the card game, brings up Skype video. Um, and this is the one thing that I mentioned about what happens when people leave without saying goodbye. That is, they have to leave the interaction before the interaction is over. Um, and this is basically something where we have to figure out what to do with a system where we haven't got all the information we need. And after a few minutes, that's because I think it should be minutes, not seconds, the agent concludes that the person has intended to end the session or is just not coming back. And then the important thing happens. It updates its model of the activities that have occurred based on its rules, concludes that something changed in the conversation. We did enough that we're no longer just acquaintances. We're companions, if you will. It's really that we've gone from closeness three to closeness six. And we use these terms loosely to talk about various kinds of closeness. OK. 
So where are we? Well, the architecture is fully implemented. We are in the process of in integrating very all of the various um, plugins. One of the things we've taken seriously in the architecture is the plugins can be written by anybody. So we have plugins written in Disco, we have plugins written in Straight Java, we have pr plugins written in a, another Disco-like language that was developed at Northeastern. Um, so we've got all kinds of, and we've got Skype Buddy, which is this odd mixture of a whole lot of things. So the point is, is that that makes for a very interesting integration problem that we're just now kind of pushing uh, full scale head on. And we're developing a bunch, a bunch of these plugins at this time. Um, I mentioned we're going to have both a virtual agent condition, about 14 subjects at a time in the eight virtual agent condition. We're going to have a small robotic robot condition at the moment. Our plan, which could change if they turn out to be bad, is to use robokines. Um, and that's because we'd like something that is similar enough to the virtual agent that it makes sense to look at a comparison. Um, I'm excited about this because much of the work that's been done in the HRI community, the human and robotic interaction community, about robots has largely been done on stuff about very small time scales. You have one interaction with the robot. You may or may not have ever seen a robot before or interacted with it before. And there's a lot of stuff about the fact that people trust robots more than they do virtual agents. I'd like to see if that turns out to be true on a longer kind of interaction and really have a chance to look at for the same kinds of activities what that looks like. Obviously, it's a different story once you have a robot that can go move around in the world, pick things up for you, all of the stuff that I think robotics really you know, gets to do that you can't do any other way. But um, before we get there, it'd be nice to understand where it matters if it does in these activities that don't involve manipulation of, of much of the world. Um, so as I mentioned, the proof of the pudding is coming. Uh, we are starting a one month evaluation in the fall of 2013. I want to mention one other thing is I haven't talked at all about incremental processing. Nothing about incremental processing the language, but even incremental processing as a whole. The architecture that we built doesn't, thank God, keep you from doing incremental processing, but it's not kind of helping you in any way. And in the language case, we really have nothing to say because we're using menus of utterances and therefore there's nothing incremental about language in the way that people like Matthias Schutz or James Allen or G.J. Kruf at DFKI or David Traum at ICT have been exploring, which is the fact that you can start to make decisions about what you're doing when you hear just the first few words of what it is that someone says and you will adapt those decisions if you hear a little more of the conversation, a little more of an utterance and a little more. And I think this is really important because one of the things we know when you look at speech is that speech is not utterances for God's sake. I mean sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's these very short intonational phrases I like to call it. It comes from work by Janet Pierre Humbert. There are other kinds of things and we make progress on that. And getting that story right I think is really important. So the work we're doing does not help us push forward those notions very much. And I thought it was important to say something about that business. Okay, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Right here first. I think that was a little bit more about the resource arbitration. Mm -hmm. We have one centralized arbitration mm -hmm. or our activities themselves. <coughs> Can they observe the, the context, say, well, I'm, I'm the running activity, I've been playing for 10 minutes, I think it's a good time to stop. No, it's, we have a central arbitrator central. and it's using a fuzzy, fuzzy logic model to figure out what it ought to be doing. Okay. That's the, uh, you know, it's, it's still, a fairly simple architecture in that respect. So, Reed. So, I mean, in my experience, the, the interruption is really, really hard to do. Like, I mean, it's yeah. It so it, it seems that you need a lot more of the semantics of the task 
in, in order to decide when a, when a natural break occurs in an activity. Right, so it's three o'clock, it's time for the Skype buddy. You're one, one card away from finishing the Rummy game, but no, the Rummy game's over because uh, it's three o'clock and it's time for the Skype buddy call. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, that's a very real so, problem. So, yeah. how do you see, I mean, yeah. is, that, is that type of task information in your schemas that no. could be used to? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's really not at all. And it's partly it's not there because um, if you think about the places where this most typically happens, there are things like card games, which are really hard to predict in some sense. Um, you know, things happen in the card games unless you've got a very good model of how the card game is going. It's very hard to know things like, well, we're one, you know, we're one turn away from my winning the hand. Okay, well, so, right, so, so in my case, in my case yeah. it's pretty easy, for instance, in the Scrabble game to know when you're getting close to the end. And you know, that, that, that type of interruption. Yeah. But also, you know, um, you're telling a story or you're, you, you talk, you, you know, your example was, it's, it's time to broach the subject about a diet, okay? And so there is some expectation of how that conversation is gonna go. Now it's three o'clock and I'm gonna stop the diet talk and I'm gonna go to Skype buddy. If you cut that off at inappropriate times, well, then Feel yes. The only thing that mitigates this in the architecture we've been playing around with is because the resource arbitrator, in the case of interrupting things over time, because of the way it works, it's paying attention to time coming up and can say, you know, in five minutes, we're going to have to stop this. So you get some kind of bit of information about this. But there's nothing that we've invented that would take care of this problem of push it a little further out because that particular plugin says, you know, the or, critical or, or, point or, or is coming. Mean, do you have, or even the opposite to say, let's, let's shorten the, this discussion because things are, we're coming up against a deadline. So instead of having yeah, a right. five minute conversation about diet, I'll have a two minute right. conversation. Right. In fact, to change the, the obvious way to do this, frankly, in the models that have dialogue structure, is to say let's stop the dialogue at a particular point in the structure where these natural, you know, segmentation points, mm -hmm. um, and we don't even try and do that at the moment either. Yeah. Well, I guess the so. question is, but but that that information is in the dialogue structure that you could reason about. Well, I, for applications that are written in a disco-like formalism, yes, you could do that. But since we're allowing people to, you know, do whatever, I mean, the ones I've done, like the weather system is all, you know, it's this lovely <laughs> dialogue structure, blah, blah, blah. But for example, the calendar program is nothing like that. We had a student hack it together over summer. He did a great job, but it's not, it's not a disco system at all. So, you know, chill. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what you're trying to get out of the deployment for the month? What are you planning on measuring? What kind of data are you taking? What questions do you want to answer? Because I think it's an incredibly <coughs> rich and yeah. unique opportunity. So yeah. I'm really interested in what you're going in looking for, other than it should just maybe work for <laughs> <laughs> this is work for a month. Well, <laughs> there are some. Not only should it work for a month, but that people should want to use it over that period of time. And we have some evidence. We've got a prototype system that's been fielded for a couple of people's homes. And all you can talk about is the weather in a very simplified way and do exercise programs. And it's been fielded in a couple houses and we're about to field it in five or six more. Um, and it just has, it has a bit of sensory stuff. So it, um, it, uh, it notices, it uses motion sensing to figure out that someone is there. So the very first thing is, will people use this sort of thing? We're interested in something about their, um, their sort of over, overall mood and whether that changes over the course of the month's period of time. Is that by self-report? Yeah, no, there's a set of standards, like, you know, you give people these standard tests and get them and look at those kinds of things. Um, we're interested to know what kinds of things people like to do with the agent. Until um, we have this full plate of possibilities, we don't even know what things will people actually do and what will they tell us at the end of the month about what they're actually doing with it. 
Um, so there's a bunch of things, and frankly, the baseline condition, the base, the you know, the control condition is people who, you know, we do a bunch of measures at the at the beginning of a month, and at the end of the month, we call them back up and ask them to do the same measures again. So it's a very kind of, you know, from you don't have any interaction at all to something that does a lot of different things. Um, Right. Um, this is always an issue for things that are long term. Tim Bickmore's done a lot of this kind of work, mostly of the login variety. You know, you log in once a day and you tell it about your exercise behavior and stuff. And people usually say somewhere around the two week mark they notice that there's a kind of sameness about the thing. Um, and there's only so much that we can do about that. What I'm hoping will help to some extent with sameness, and we'll find out, is the fact that this is a lot of different things. So you can have a lot of conversations, I mean, different kinds of conversations, you know, the weather and all this kind of stuff. And, and in fact, if we have time, and we have a couple of students to do, and we actually want to do a memory game, um, and we actually want to do a meditation app. We thought it would be kind of cool. I mean, those are kind of easy and cheap to put together. So it's a lot of different things you could do with someone. And the question is, you know, what will that whole process be like? We've also considered a third, well, it's actually a fourth arm if you consider the robot study, a fourth arm which is to look at what if there's no face but everything else happens. So that's one possibility we're kicking around. The alternative would be, to play around with several different things, make the face go away for a week, change something else about the interaction for another couple of weeks. I mean, I even propose we turn off the, the relationship planner, and, but my, my colleague Tim Bickmore said, won't do that much. So, <laughs> so I don't think we're going to run enough arms to find out all of that. Um, but, you know, we're kind of curious about a bunch of different things. So Scott. what's, do, do you have something that, Okay, what's particularly exciting to me about this is it's a total system with all these different levels and different components. Yeah. And you're really kind of illustrating kind of how it, what's required to make it all hang together. Yeah. Uh, and we're uh, crazy. To, to achieve that, you necessarily yeah. drastically simplified most of the components. Yes, that's right. In many and ways, we did. Simplification in particular worries me a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of closeness which mm -hmm. is your central organizing principle. It's what you're trying to maximize. Right. That's not really a scaler. <laughs> Certainly not closeness in the sense of, you know, there are people I'm very close to, but we're not going to talk about religion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or uh, I know they're not interested in sports. Or, or, or politics for that matter, right? Well, and, you know, it's, it's really a very multidimensional thing. Yeah. Particularly, you know, some simplifications make things harder. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you can no longer express that which you need to do, in this case, control what activities are appropriate next and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, is a, it absolutely is a simplification. One of my favorite examples of the way it is is it has no model of power structure. Yeah. I mean, relationships have a whole lot of well, other interesting yeah. complications. Um, I can think of about 20 dimensions. Yeah, right. right. And so. But for the nature of the kinds of activities we're talking about, I think we are likely to squeak by. But notice there isn't, you know, there isn't a little content plug-in for you know, talking about the past election or even in Massachusetts we're about to have one this spring because our, our uh, senior senator is about to become the Secretary of State. Um, so well, no, we're not going to have one of those. That leads you know? into modeling the other person. Yes, it does. Yeah, much, 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 much more. There's a little bit of modeling that happens here, who your friends are. There's a, an app that I'm building which asks you to tell more about who your friends are, you know, who they are, where they live, what their not children's how names, how old they are, all that kind of dumb stuff. Yeah. Um, and maybe a little bit about what you like about them and if which we won't try and parse because that could get incredibly interesting. Well, so, uh, like but that's really simple-minded, I agree. Very complicated model in that area is obviously beyond, you know, step or three beyond. Right, right. But, uh, it but the other nice reason is that, that yes, it, and the other thing is, is if we had such a much richer model, then we would want to 
be able to reason about that in interesting ways. Yeah. So you'd want to be able to change, for example, the relationship planner to say, I know certain things about this person. Um, that means, you know, they're probably they'll probably get sucked more in by doing these kinds of things. Well, with I think them that's or whatever. the next good thesis for yeah, the yeah. next great students. So but they that's don't have to a worry about what they're wrong, and now you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I think there are plenty of hard problems. That, yes, we are kind of going. You know, walking by them. Yes. So oh, wait a minute. Fritch, oh, is sorry. there anybody else who would like to ask a question <laughs> or make a comment or whatever? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I would like to know what, how do you detect emotion of the person? How do we what? Detect emotion of the person. Um, so we have two ways to do that. One is we have a motion sensor to give us a broad sense of when someone kind of comes into the space as a whole. Um, motion or emotion? Yeah. Oh, motion. Just motion. Motion, yeah. And so that's the first thing. The second layer is when they come into range of the camera. Um, we originally <laughs> experimented with having, uh, putting a fisheye lens on the camera because the camera actually has a really narrow cone for where you can actually see somebody come into the room. Um, and we ex experimented with a larger one and that worked a little better and decided that mm, things would probably go wrong so we're going so we decided to do motion sensing and then of course in the once the person comes in range of the camera we're using a really simple mechanism to tell whether they're far away or close simply on the size of the of the face um, we're also a little bit cheating these people live alone so we mostly don't have to worry about there being two faces in the screen um, now, when we actually get to tuning the system, unless the algorithms have gotten way better in the, the last couple systems I've used, you get faces out of things that aren't faces. This thing might, you know, might turn out, certain boxy kind of funny things end up looking like faces, and so we may have a problem about that. Um, so they, they tend to be the small things. They tend to be small. So they tend to look like they're in the distance. Yeah, and they don't move and all that stuff. If we're really stuck, we could do something we did once before, which is use sound and detection to figure out where the person actually, which direction the, the noise is actually coming from. Are you considering uh, Say again? Are you considering including gesture detection? Or are you, like you mean like the stuff I do with my hands? No, and that's largely because we don't have good theories of that stuff at the moment, so we wouldn't know what to do with it even if somebody could give us a tool for doing that. Um, I'll tell you one app we have not decided to do. Early on in this project, Tim Bickmore and his students, and I went along with a little bit of this, we actually went out and watched human beings who are companions to older adults in the Boston area. There's a program in Boston called the, no, it's not the Companions Program, some other name. And people sign up to go be a companion with an old person. They meet together with them once a week. And these relationships goes go on often until the person's no longer alive. So we're talking about years and years of this kind of thing. So, so we studied, we went and watched people do this, watched what they did, you know, tagged along a couple times. And the application we're not building is co-television watching. <laughs> Largely we decided not to do that because it drives me crazy to think that we might encourage people to watch more television. I sort of have ethical issues about this. But it also has some really interesting technical problems, which is how do you talk about television shows with somebody else? Um, so if you want to build an interesting app, <laughs> go for it. Question? Yeah. So in your architecture, you talk about the motion detection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, any ideas on that, how you're going to do it? We're actually, um, we are using a um, motion detection, we're using a garage door sensor, you know, and when we pick it up, it trips some information that's then fed into the, into the agent. It's a really simple kind of mechanism, and not hard at all, so. Just, just the motion sensors? Yeah, just motion, garage door motion, motion sensors. You can get ones now that are about this big, so they sit nicely with the, you know, the hardware that we're giving people and so forth. So it works pretty easily. It's highly reliable. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it's been around forever. Yeah? So if a user comes in looking exceptionally happy or sad, does that bias the system to ask the user to give a story or something like that? Um, 
That would be really interesting to do that. Um, when somebody gets really good at exceptionally ha sad and happy faces, um, it, it will be time to explore some of that. In fact, I have a student, a doctoral student, looking at um, issues about emotion, uh, emotion and collaboration. Um, but at the moment, we don't have any, we are not making use of emotion detection. Um, down the road, you know, we hope this, I'd like to make the system turn over with whatever our student manages to cook up, but we're not going to end up testing that technology by next fall because it won't be there. So, uh, and you know. Another question. Um, does the user have any control on what topic to talk about? Can yeah. they suggest topics? That uh, they can't really suggest topics because there really isn't any way to do that. Mm -hmm. But the user gets control. You know, the agent says, you want to talk about the weather? No. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? How about that? There's, there's a collection, you know, that, that activity plan turns into a, a bunch of things we can talk about and do, and the user has control over them. And in fact, if they, in a session, decide they, early on in the session, they don't want to, for example, um, well, the weather's kind of a funny case, but if there's something they don't want to do, if there's time, it's possible to go back to that before the session ends. Um, but that's the, that's the extent to which the user has control and that's because, remember, we have to create these menus for things to do and those menus, you know, we don't build on the fly. Uh, well, not all of them, we build them on the fly for things like, you know, what's happening with sports and, and weather, but mostly we don't build those on the fly. Yeah. So. I was thinking it might be nice to have an option, a list of topics or something like that that users can select. Because maybe on this day they come in, they feel like talking about something. Well, they have, uh, they have options. You know, it's would you like to do this or that kind of thing. If there's a fork in the, in the plan high up for the day, they get, uh, and they get options along the way. But the point is, is that they can't spontaneously say, hey, today I really want to talk about, I don't know, my, my grandmother. There isn't any way to do that kind you of thing. Menu. Yeah. Huh? You could give them a menu instead of making them do the tree. Give a menu and some no no the, it appears as a menu the tree gets turned into okay. a menu of would you like to do this or you know would you like to do you know and pick, you pick, pick, pick yeah a couple of things are listed down the page that's that's kind of the easy part but something that's more sort of spontaneous on the user's part is is the problem yeah in your long term study when you change the embodiment conditions so having a visualization for a social model yeah what are your initial hypothesis of how do you think things will change? So I have two minds about this. One is that people will like the robot a whole lot better. Okay, they'll be, they'll think it's much neater somehow, it's physically there. When it looks at them, they have a much, you know, more clear sense of, wow, this thing is looking at me, all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> the other part of my brain says, and this comes from the Nass and Reeves works, it's all media for God's sake. People all go nuts about this media. And they impute all kinds of things to you know, CRT screens. <coughs> so in fact, it won't matter at all. They'll, they'll do the same kinds of things. They'll, each group will report they equally like it. Now this is, we're doing a, um, a between subjects experiment obviously, that they'll report you know, mm. equally that they like it. And that's what the other part of my brain says. But <laughs> So I don't know. I think even another possibility, which is uh, yeah. it will be in people's homes, so it's more intrusive having this yes. digital entity. It is, it is. It might also be the case that they prefer the agent more because it's more like there and Yeah, yeah. It, yes, that's also another possibility that they that they like the agent better. So, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how this one plays out. That might be, that might yeah. be a good good way because Maybe the introverts will like agents talking to them and extroverts will like a robot talking to them. Yeah, a long time ago I learned via uh, Justine and Tim Bookmore that that's, and Tim actually is the one who's going to employ and deploy all this stuff, is that one of the things you look at is personality. It's one of the things you test for at the <coughs> beginning so you can look at that as a variable in right. people's behavior. So, uh, yes sir, back here. Maybe that'll be the that'll last, be the one. last one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You said that you use a very simplistic method for your face recognition because there's generally only going to be one face. 
Would the system fail if there is, for instance, a television in the field that can see recognition cameras? Um, well, that's one of those cases about face detection, you know, what you make of, of other kinds of things that are in the room. If you've got a TV dead center and thing and it's got a face in it, it's possible that will cause us trouble. Um, and, but, you know, at some point it, when that happens, the agent says, you know, hi, Sally. And when the thing doesn't, when the person doesn't come and respond to them, then it's sitting there like, okay, no interaction is happening at this time. And it has to wait and decide, you know, what to do. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>